morning. morning. Welcome to worship this morning. Just a couple of announcements. Um, For those staying for God's work, our hands, if you want to help pack uh, school kits, that will be in the education wing. Um, If you want to sign cards, well, we hope everybody signs cards, uh, it will be in Fellowship Hall. So those are our, our two locations that we're doing things. Um, we'd like to welcome Danielle Schaub this morning. Thank you for being here. And Mom Pickup is next Sunday. Uh, Saturday, I'm sorry. Next Saturday, you said 10 to 11.30? Okay. And if you don't pick them up on Saturday, they will be here on Sunday. So, but we prefer, I think they prefer everybody pick them up on Saturday. Uh, Other than that, we welcome Pastor Eli. Thank you for being here. Any other announcements? Seeing none, let us begin worship. Danielle, Ed, thank you for that. Beautifully done. Good morning. morning. It's good to see you. It's good to be here together and appreciate music like that that can brighten our hearts and lift our souls. I trust that has happened for you this morning already and that God will visit us with his spirit and speak to all of us. Let's prepare ourselves for that as we stand for our confession and forgiveness, please. 
Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who is eager to forgive and who loves us beyond our days. Amen. Dear friends, together let us acknowledge our failure to love this world as Jesus does. God of mercy and forgiveness, we, we confess, confess that, that sin has, has a hold on us. We, we have, have harmed our your good creation. creation. We, we have, have failed, failed to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with you. Turn us in a new direction. Show us the path that leads to life. Be our refuge and strength on the journey through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and friend. Amen. Beloved of God, your sins are forgiven and you are made whole. God points the way to new life in Christ who meets us on the road. Journey now in God's abiding love through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's take that hymnal, turn to number 524. What is this place? 524, please. Friends, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you.
glory to God. Let us pray. O God, overflowing with mercy and compassion, you lead back to yourself all those who go astray. Preserve your people in your loving care that we may reject whatever is contrary to you and may follow all things that sustain our life in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading today is from Exodus. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people whom you've brought up out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I command them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshiped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone so that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them. And of you, I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the, implored the Lord, his God, and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people? whom you've brought out of Egypt with great power, with a mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn your fierce wrath, change your mind, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. In your great compassion, blot out my offenses. Wash me through and through from my wickedness and cleanse me from my sin. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. For I know my offenses and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are justified when you speak and write in your judgment. Indeed, I was born steeped in wickedness, a sinner from my mother's womb. Indeed, you delight in truth deep within me and would have me know wisdom deep within. Remove my sins with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be purer than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness that the body you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my wickedness. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. The second reading is from 1 Timothy. I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me, because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his servants, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, 
of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason, I received mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. I like that. <laughs> Wonderful. Isn't it good to be in God's house with God's people? The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep, and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that, has, that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. The Gospel according to the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Our office manager, Ed, has provided a thought-provoking and moving piece of artwork on the front of our cover. He's also included the information about that artwork by an artist by the name of Alfred Usher Sword. The information we learned there is he was born in 1890, or 1868 and died in 1915. He was a British painter whose famous work is here before you. Showing, as you can tell, a sheep stranded halfway down a steep cliff and the shepherd risking his own life to save it. That shepherd, as you look at that picture, hangs on with his left hand while he reaches out for that sheep with his right hand. A balancing act, to be sure. A risk to his own safety and well-being. 
No doubt the sword was inspired by the gospel we just read from Luke chapter 15. Unlike Jesus' first hearers, the artist must have been moved emotionally and intuitively to interpret on campus, on canvas, the risk and the courageous love a shepherd has, reaching out to rescue one lost sheep. By the way, friends, as you study the Gospels, you will discover that Jesus seldom called people sinners. Instead, he called them lost. It is unlikely that the first hearers of this story were so moved. Luke says that the religious elite there were grumbling. They were murmuring. It reminds us of the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, where the Israelites murmured against Moses. Here the Pharisees and the scribes are talking among themselves about the disgust they had at the kind of people Jesus seemed to gather around himself. Luke called them tax collectors and sinners. The kind of folk a decent person would know better to steer away from. It seemed evident that not only did Jesus attract that kind of riffraff, he might have even taken to hosting them at occasion or two. Rather than arguing with the religious elite and trying to justify himself, Jesus simply began telling stories. Instead of point blank asking the religious experts why they seemed to get all bent out of shape because common people were yearning to know God, Jesus took what might have seemed like a tangent. Instead of getting defensive, Instead of pointing fingers at the religious crowd and accusing them of forgetting about their main purpose, their joy and love for the very God they claim to serve, Jesus told stories. And he tells lots of them, almost without stopping. One writer has said she thinks this is Jesus' party chapter in Luke for all three stories about lost things. The lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son, have as their climax a great party. So it's pretty safe to imagine that Jesus may have been thinking, when did you religious people become such sour pusses? Or, what happened to those days when you cherished the Psalms and proclaimed that the joy of the Lord is my strength? But no, he didn't say any of that to his accusers. Instead, he told stories to confront, to challenge, and to teach. When you really stop and think about it, even his stories rubbed people the wrong way. Certainly these two did. A story about a shepherd, known back then for not really being on the up and up, unable to come in from the field and clean up and go to worship. Even before this story was recorded by Luke, shepherds were actually, had made it onto a list a list of despised trades, along with camel drivers, sailors, gamblers, those who dyed fabric, and of course, tax collectors. So despite how sweet such stories about sheep and shepherds might sound today, imagine, my friend, how you would react if I started telling stories about drug dealers or pimps I think you get the idea. Then there's this story about this poor woman who lost one of her ten coins. Each coin probably worth only about a day's wage. Clearly not a lot of money. She was impoverished. 
not at all prepared for retirement and not financially able to host grand parties. Scholars say her little house was so tiny, it probably didn't even have a window in it, but just a small door. But she takes her broom, and she turns that house upside down, searching for that lost coin. Those of us who might like order and quiet and keeping everything on an even keel probably would not have wanted to be around that woman as she stormed around her house. Friends, there are really two levels to both of these stories. There is the personal level, where you might put yourself in the lost sheep's shoes, if you will. If you do that, you end up being mighty glad for that risk-taking shepherd who goes after you. Folks who know a lot more about shepherding tell us that a common thing for a sheep to do when it is lost is to stop in its tracks and do nothing. When you might cower in fear and simply give up because you lost your way or felt you were out in the cold left out there by the crowd, you're thankful for someone who comes to bring you home. I wouldn't suppose that the lost coin has any feelings like the sheep might have, but wouldn't it be nice to be among those neighbors that poor woman called, inviting them to celebrate that she had found her coin. But then there's another level that may be the reason Jesus told these stories. Don't forget the context. Jesus told the stories in response to the grumbling he heard from the religious crowd regarding the kind of riffraff who were attracted to Jesus. So I think there's a level of how these parables speak to today's religious establishment, the church. Perhaps that's where the silent majority, the 99 sheep safely within the fold, might find their voice. I can imagine what they might say. What about us? There are 99 of us here left, more than enough to constitute a decent church. Maybe that lone, wayward, lost sheep really wasn't cut out to be part of us anyway. Instead, we see the shepherd risking to save the lost, even when those safely in the fold don't seem to notice that someone among them is in jeopardy. If we aren't careful, our vision can become small. I graduated from Asbury Theological Seminary. Asbury is a United Methodist school, so I've known a number of Methodist ministers over the years. One couple began their ministry serving in a church, working with children on Sunday mornings. They couldn't believe it when the pastor and the leaders of that church handed the keys to the church bus one day declaring that they had decided that this couple would become the official bus pastors. What that meant was that they would be able to take that bus, go all, all over town and pick up children and bring them to church on Sunday morning. So naturally they started in their own neighborhood walking door to door on, Sunday mor on Saturday mornings, introducing themselves to the families there, inviting their children to come to church on Sunday, that they would be back on Sunday morning and pick them up. Their children's ministry began to grow. One day they left town on a short vacation, and when they came back to church, they found out there was new instruction. It appears that while they were gone, some of the church leaders had gotten together to discuss the problem of the church's children's ministry. The black children from their neighborhood 
were causing trouble, supposedly, with the white children whose parents were members of that church. The new instructions were that they were to no longer pick up those black children on Sunday mornings. But because they were doing a great job, they were free to take that bus on Saturday mornings, pick those children up, and have a little church service with them somewhere in a nearby park. Needless to say, they, this couple was sickened and, and disappointed. But they did exactly what they were told. But after a while, seeing the look on those children's eyes, they couldn't take it anymore. They resigned from being the bus pastors and left that church. The church refused to take risks and change. Perhaps we should always remember that true saying, the price of progress is the problems it creates. But it's important how we deal with those problems. Sometimes the church can lose its very soul when it forgets or neglects to risk in order to find the loss. Those folks in that safe white church were pretty lost in their fear and in their prejudice. So lost, in fact, they didn't see the joyous openness those children brought. They were blind to it. Friends, lost sheep still abound. They're out there. Some are frozen in their tracks. They're people we don't even know. And there are people in our own families and social circles. If you don't believe me, ask those volunteers down at the Refuge of Hope or the Oatmeal Ministry or help feeding street people. Every day, there are people right in our own area, around the world, who somehow have gotten lost along the way. Lost coins are somewhere out there if someone has the gumption to turn the house upside down. Jesus said in Luke 19, verse 10, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And when the lost are found, what results is a party. A celebration. May that be so for us as well. Amen. Our hymn of the day, number 608, Softly and Tenderly, Jesus is Calling. Would you stand and sing with me together? 608, please.
let us profess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As scattered grains of wheat are gathered together into one bread, so let us gather our prayers for the church, those in need, and all of God's good creation. Your people receive mercy and your grace overflows in our lives. Fill your church with faith and love and give understanding hearts to those who work to strengthen our economical and interreligious committees. God of grace. Hear our prayer. Your creation groans as it suffers the impacts of pollution and lack of care. As the seasons change, renew in us the will to protect plants, animals, and habitats. Bless us with bountiful harvests that all may share. God of grace. Hear our prayer. Your world is shattered and the nations rage. Remember us in your mercy. Teach wisdom to our elected leaders so that we know peace in our world, peace in our homes, and peace in our hearts. God of grace. Hear our prayer. Your children wander homeless and the hungry cry for bread. Seek out those who are lost or lonely, anxious or depressed, or struggling with addiction or illness. Provide for those in any need, especially those we now name aloud or in the silence of our hearts. God of grace, hear our prayer. Your work is done in this congregation with our hands, feet, voices, minds, and hearts. Build up the ministries of this that we serve our neighbors and welcome the stranger in your name, God of grace. Hear our prayer. We join our prayers with all those who mourn the death of Queen Elizabeth. Rest eternal, grant her, O Lord, and let light perpetual shine upon her. God of grace. Hear our prayer. For first responders and for our nation as we remember the September 11th 2001 attacks. Remember those who lost their lives, those who were injured and are still living with the aftermath. God of grace. Hear our prayer. Your blessed saints who have died now rest in your presence. Give us thankful hearts for those who have been examples of faith in our lives and receive us with joy when we come to share eternal life with you. God of grace. Hear our prayer. Gather together in the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, gracious God. We offer these and all our prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Friends, the peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Greet those around you and remain seated, please. And please be seated.
Let us pray. Gracious God, in your great love, you richly provide for our needs. Make of these gifts a banquet of blessing and make us ready to share with all in need through Jesus Christ, who sets a table for all. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks for it. He broke it. Gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it, all, gave it to all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Christ invites you to this table. body of Christ given for you.
the blood of Christ shed for you. Pray with me, please. God of the abundant table, you have refreshed our hearts in this meal with bread for the journey. Give us your grace on the road that we might serve our neighbors with joy for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Say I am. 
with Christ beside you. Thanks be to God.